any technology worth adopting is often adopted first by criminals. I mean, criminals are some of the greatest beta, technology, beta testers of new technologies. Think about it. Although we all now use the internet every day for everything, way back when, some of the first adopters of the internet were fraudsters and child pornographers. And the digital currency, Bitcoin, and the technology underlying it, the blockchain, they're really no different. I mean, after all, this technology did get its renown uh, by helping, to, helping drug de dealers sell drugs on the dark net. But it turns out that like all great technologies, the blockchain's no different. And it turns out that the blockchain can end up doing a lot more good than bad. It can help solve crime, and it can help stop fraud. How do I know? Well, although I'm here in my personal capacity, I've been a federal prosecutor for over a decade. And in that time, I have put murderers, organized criminals, cartels, white-collar thieves, and cyber criminals behind bars. In fact, I prosecuted some of the earliest Bitcoin criminals. Let me tell you the story. But it involves a twist, because it involves the blockchain being used for bad, but ultimately being used for good to catch the bad guys. And the bad guys aren't who you might think in this story. This story is a story about a failed murder-for-hire plot, the Silk Road, and a pair of corrupt federal agents who tried to destroy evidence to, to hide their crimes, but they couldn't escape the blockchain. Many of you already know the story of the Silk Road. And basically, for those who don't, uh, just in summary, the Silk Road was a dark net marketplace where you could buy everything from heroin to fake passports. Criminal enterprise or libertarian paradise? That depends on your perspective. But the one thing we can all agree on is that without technologies like Bitcoin and like blockchain, these darknet sites like the Silk Road and those that followed them wouldn't be possible. And in fact, these anonymizing technologies were making it really hard for the government to find out who was running the Silk Road. The government had a federal task force. It had a couple task forces, and one of them was back outside of the Washington, D.C. area, the Federal Silk Road Task Force, comprised of all of these agencies up here, all of some of the ones that you just heard about. But they couldn't find out who was running the Silk Road. All they knew at this time was that that person went by the moniker DPR for Dread Pirate Roberts from the movie The Princess Bride. <laughs> but the government had a secret weapon. It had an undercover federal agent, a DEA agent, whose cover was Knob. And Knob his cover story was that he was a drug lord with connections to the criminal underworld. And his mission was to identify, to become a close online confidant of DPR in an effort to identify him and find out where he was so that he could be arrested. Now, 2013 was not a good year for the Silk Road. A couple things were going on. First, someone named Death from Above so these are online monikers, of course. Someone named Death from Above was extorting DPR, demanding hundreds of thousands of dollars. Or else, Death from Above would reveal DPR's true identity to law enforcement. And another online persona, French Maid. French Maid, I can't make this up, French Maid <laughs> was selling DPR information into the government's case also hundreds of thousands of dollars. The payments, of course, were in Bitcoin. And then amidst all this in 2013, another bad thing happened. And that is that 21,000 Bitcoin, which at its height, Bitcoin is volatile and fluctuates dramatically in price, but at its height, this 21,000 Bitcoin would have been worth $25 million. And overnight, this went missing from Silk Road vendor accounts. Who did it? DPR conducts an investigation and pretty quickly determines it's his right-hand man. 
one of the Silk Road administrators, a man by the name of Curtis Green, who was living in Utah at the time. And so DPR orders a hit on Green, ironically turning to Knob to do the hit. Knob is our undercover federal agent, unbeknownst to DPR. Also unbeknownst to DPR was that by this point, Curtis Green was already cooperating with the feds, with Knob, and with that entire federal Silk Road task force outside of Washington, D.C. And as part of that cooperation, Curtis Green had already turned over his passwords, his credentials, and his username and computer to the feds. So when the $25 million worth of Bitcoin goes missing, the feds confront Green and they say, we know you took the money, you better just fess up. But Green was insistent, he did nothing wrong. He pointed out, he didn't even have a computer, he turned it over the morning of the theft to the task force, to the feds. So, Knob and the task force go about staging Green's murder. And they take photos of Green supposedly being tortured and executed. Now, I'll spare you the photos, they're pretty disgusting, but they provide those photos to DPR. And then later in 2013, fast forward, the government uncovers that DPR is actually Ross Ulbricht. And as many of you know, Ross Ulbricht was tried and prosecuted in New York as part of a different case as for being the mastermind of the Silk Road. But some mysteries persisted even after this trial. First of all, who'd stolen the $25 million worth of Bitcoin? And who'd been extorting Ulbricht as death from above? And who'd been selling him information into the government's case as French made? Well, in 2014, I was sitting here in San Francisco in my office, where I sit, and I got a tip. The tip caused me to look into Knob, that undercover agent. The tip was not about the Silk Road, though. The tip was, the gist of it was, Knob's moving around a lot of Bitcoin. You ought to look into it. And, you know, that's not a crime to own Bitcoin and move it around. So I thought, well, what can we do? We can look into it. We look into it uh, because of the severity of the allegation, of course. He's a federal agent. And I find that he's liquidating hundreds of thousands of dollars a month in Bitcoin to his own personal bank accounts. And I also find that then using his agent status, he's asked those exchanges who are doing the liquidating to destroy all the transaction history. So now I'm intrigued by this tip. <laughs> Here's where the blockchain comes in. What is the blockchain? Well, for our purposes, think of the blockchain as a vast global database spread out over millions of computers all over the world. And it stores transactions of value, uh, or it represents transactions of value of any kind of thing of value, money, information, any asset. And the thing about the blockchain is that it's public. It's transparent. You can hop right onto the internet, it turns out, and track things through the blockchain. It's immutable and permanent. And in this way, it acts like a digital timestamp. Any information about a transaction that gets onto the blockchain, can't get rid of it. It's there forever. It's also highly reliable through some cryptographic wizardry that I will not explain to you right now. I don't think you want a government a lawyer explaining to you uh, cryptography. But just take my word for it that because of this cryptographic wizardry, once the info gets on the blockchain, you can rely upon it and trust it. Because we all have copies of these da this database that I described, and all those copies match of the database, millions all over the world. It's also decentralized. And this makes it harder, it, it makes it tamper-proof and harder to hack. Imagine a bank vault somewhere in the world, and that bank vault has in it tons of money and information. Let's just say the world, all of the world's information and money in this one vault. If thieves break in, they can take everything. But now think of millions of individual vaults all over the world, each holding information and assets. And thieves 
would have to break in to each one of those vaults to get all the information, and they'd have to do it all at once. That's the blockchain for you in a nutshell. And so this is what we were learning back in these days. This is what's up on your screen here is the blockchain. This is the product of what we were looking into. I told you it's public, so we were able to hop right online, which was important because it's a sensitive thing to investigate an agent who's been a federal agent for 15 years. Um, I mean, these people are absolute heroes to us. 99.99999% of them are. And so it was important to us to use blockchain. We had this public database. And here's Knob down in the corner. And using this immutable permanent record, we traced the source of Knob's bitcoins. And imagine our surprise when we traced where it led back to, the Silk Road. It turns out that Knob had been death from above, extorting Ross Ulbricht. It turns out that Knob had also been French made, selling <laughs> Ross Ulbricht information into the government's investigation. But we still had a mystery. Who stole the $25 million from the Silk Road vendor accounts? The Bitcoin. Let me go back. Let's talk about this mystery. I know what you're all thinking. It must be Knob. He's done all this other stuff, of course. He must have done this too. That's kind of what we were all thinking. But we have this public database that we can go look to. And we look at it, and we see up on the screen here, these patterns don't quite look the same on the blockchain as Knob's patterns of theft look. OK, so we trace, using this immutable database, we trace back the funds that were gone missing from the Silk Road, and we trace them to Mt. Gox, which was an online digital currency exchange in Japan. Now, unfortunately, by this time in our investigation, Mt. Gox had gone belly up. And so its records weren't easily accessible to us. But remember what I told you about the blockchain? It's permanent, and it's immutable, and its records cannot be erased or tampered with. So we use the blockchain to follow the funds from Mt. Gox to a US bank account held in a shell company name. And imagine our surprise when we found out who owned the shell company. Another federal agent on the Silk Road Task Force with the Secret Service. He was the government's expert in cryptocurrency and Tor. The amazing thing is there's no evidence suggesting he and his co-case agent, Knob, were even working together. The Secret Service agent had also been at that session where Curtis Green had turned over his passwords and his computer. And that night, he'd taken those passwords and computer, and he drained about $25 million worth of Bitcoin, staging and framing Curtis Green in the process, and sitting by the next day while the feds accused Curtis Green of doing this and knowing that there had been a hit put out on him. So, da-da-da-da. <laughs> last year, my office indicted these federal agents for crimes ranging from extortion to embezzlement obstruction, money laundering, you name it. It's stuff out of a movie. And in fact, believe it or not, some of the guys in this story had 20th Century Fox movie deals. <laughs> but here's the thing. Well, they pled guilty, and they're now sitting in prison for, for many years, those agents, right now. But just barely, because we almost didn't catch them. Because these guys were the perfect criminals. They knew how to cover their tracks. They were able to use their agent status to get other people and companies unwittingly to destroy evidence. But they couldn't escape from that permanent, immutable, public, transparent database, the blockchain. They couldn't tamper with that like they destroyed other forms of evidence and they tinkered with other government databases in this case. But they couldn't do that with the blockchain. And we also would have, without the blockchain, kept we wouldn't have kept looking once we got to Knob until we saw those patterns on the blockchain that it wasn't the same. So the point I want to leave you with is that without the blockchain, these guys would still be federal agents today instead of in the federal penitentiary. Now, aside from its salacious facts, this case is notable because it's one of the first examples, if not the first example, of the US government act actually using, innovating, and using the blockchain to solve a crime. 
And it's also one of the first examples, or might be the first example, of the government using it for public good, to end some public corruption and strengthen government accountability. And, and guess what? Since this case, we have used the blockchain to solve a number of other major frauds and hacks. Most of those haven't yet been announced. Many of them wouldn't have been solved without this blockchain. Turns out, we can use the blockchain to do a lot more public good in the area of public records. Because right now, we live in a world where a central authority of some type, typically the government, tells us who owns what and who has rights to what. Uh, the DMV has got your title for your car. The county recorder who tells who owns your house. If you want to register the fact of a birth, a marriage, or a death, you've got to head down to City Hall and you've got to stand in line and take a number. What's the problem with that? Well, aside from being inefficient and slow, which we can all relate to, the thing that concerns me most as a prosecutor is that it's rife with possibilities for tampering and for fraud. For tampering, in 2008, the city of San Francisco's head network administrator became disgruntled after getting some poor performance reviews. So what did he do? He took the entire city's uh, network hostage changing the passwords to lock out all of the other people in the process. Don't mess with the IT guy. <laughs> Anyone needing public records from San Francisco for those days were kind of out of luck. Uh, but what about forgery? This is a really big problem. In all of the cases I've prosecuted over the years, from the Hells Angels to human trafficking to fraud to bank robbery, they all have one thing in common. Somewhere along the way, they all involved a fraudged, a fraudged, not even a word, a forged, forged, fraudulent, or counterfeit, or stolen public record of some type. Birth certificate, death certificate, title, phony documents. And it's easy to see why with advances in technology. Birth certificates are a great example. Did you know that over 6,500 different entities in this country alone issue birth certificates using over 14,000 different forms. I mean, the departments of California Department of Real Estate and the Department of Health and Homeland Services, uh, they've all, Health and Human Services, they've sounded the alarm bell on all of these fraudulent certificates being out there, and it's really a big problem. Uh, birth certificates are a great example because you get a fake birth certificate, you go down to the DMV, you get your picture taken, voila, you've got a driver's license. Next, you take those documents, you go get a passport. And with those documents, folks, you can do pretty much any kind of crime you want. What's the solution? You knew I was going to say this. The solution is the blockchain. Because imagine if we could put our public records onto the blockchain so that a hospital could record a fact of a baby's birth, or a car dealer could record the fact of a, uh, a car sale. It would be highly reliable. It wouldn't be paper documents anymore. Because of that cryptographic wizardry, we know we could trust these transactions because they'd be verified. They'd also be decentralized, so it'd be hard for people to tamper with or hack this system. It would also be immutable and permanent, right? And finally, public. So government, these functions could be more self-service. Instead of having to go take a line and wait in some government office, you point who's ever asking to the fact of the blockchain. And in this way, it brings some tools to the people and gets government out of the business of being an intermediary for storing public records and lets it get back to tasks it's actually better at. I often get asked, what about privacy? Well, I'm talking here, though, about public records. So they're not private, they're public. If you want to talk about private records, let's talk about things like medical records. It turns out they're not as private as you might think. Did you know that uh, on the dark net, your medical information sells for 10 to 20 times what your financial or credit card information sells for? And did you know that already 150 million patient records have been compromised as a result of things like the Anthem data breach? Why? Because thieves use 
these uh, health information records to fake bill insurance companies or to take your patient profile and order uh, medical equipment and drugs and then resell them. So at the same time the information is valuable, it's not particularly secure because doctors and hospitals' focuses are on patient care, not as much on cybersecurity. So going back to my bank vault example, your patient records are in very few bank vaults and they're guarded by the equivalent of drunk teenagers. <laughs> Which is why people are really excited by what some researchers are doing right now at MIT with the blockchain. They're looking at encrypting private records like medical data and putting it onto the blockchain with a key-based system, encryption, so that thieves would not have a central repository or repositories to hack into, but would have to hack everyone's private individual keys and then have to do it all at once. So, what I said at the beginning. Technology can be used for good or for bad. The technology is neutral, but we're not. And we already know some of the bad uses of these technologies. You can go on the dark net today and buy a machine gun. We're just starting, though, to find out all of the good that these technologies can do, like solve crime and help prevent fraud. And as someone who has been dealing with criminals every day for over a decade, and I kind of now know how a lot of them are thinking, I can tell you we need a serious operating system upgrade. Because right now, those thieves, those forgers and fraudsters and cyber criminals, they are hacking into our centralized record systems and they're doing it every day at great societal cost to all of us. And I hope that I've given you some inkling today of how this technology that many of us originally were associating with criminal uses can actually be used to turn it on its head and stop some of those criminal uses and provide that much needed upgrade. Thank you so much.